In the previous lecture we discussed an introduction to diuretics. And we talked about renal physiology and sodium reabsorption mechanisms from the different parts of the nephron. This lecture depends on your knowledge from the previous lecture, if you haven't watched it yet, you'll find the link down in the description, and you'll also find the link of this lecture's PDF file. From the previous lecture we know that there are some important carriers, enzymes and hormones involved in sodium reabsorption. Simply, they are the targets for different kinds of diuretics. Such as carbonic anhydrase enzyme, sodium potassium and 2 chlorides importer, sodium and chlorides importer, and hormones such as aldosterone and misopressin. The first category we'll discuss is the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors such as, acetazolamide. As we know, carbonic anhydrase catalyzes the reaction of carbon dioxide and water, leading to the formation of carbonic acid, which spontaneously ionizes to a proton and bicarbonate. So the ability to exchange sodium for a proton is decreased and the presence of acetazolamide results in a mild diuresis. Bicarbonate is also retained in the lumen with marked elevation in urinary pH, that means that the urine becomes alkaline. The loss of bicarbonate causes metabolic acidosis, and decreased diuretic efficacy following several days of therapy. And phosphate excretion is increased by an unknown mechanism. So we can conclude the side effects of this drug, mild metabolic acidosis, potassium depletion, or known as hypokalemia, renal stone formation as they increase excretion of calcium and phosphate in urine, forming calcium phosphate stones, that are insoluble in alkaline urine. The drug should be avoided in patients with hepatic cirrhosis, because it could lead to a decreased excretion of ammonia, so ammonia may reach the brain causing encephalopathy. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors have a mild diuretic effect, as sodium that is not reabsorbed from PCT, can be reabsorbed from both loop of henil and DCT. So they are used for their other pharmacologic actions. Acetazolamide decreases the production of aqueous humor, and reduces intraocular pressure in patients with chronic open angle glaucoma, probably by blocking carbonic anhydrase in the ciliary body of the eye. Topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, such as dorsalamide and branzolamide, have the advantage of not causing systemic effects. Acetazolamide can be used in the prophylaxis of acute mountain sickness. It prevents weakness, breathlessness, dizziness, nausea, and cerebral as well as pulmonary edema characteristic of the syndrome. The second category we'll talk about, loop diuretics, or known as high ceiling diuretics, such as butanide, furosemide, torsemide, and ethacrinic acid. Loop diuretics inhibit the co-transport of sodium, potassium and 2 chloride, in the luminal membrane in the ascending limb of the loop of henil. Therefore, reabsorption of these ions is decreased. These agents have the greatest diuretic effect of all the diuretic drugs, as we know the ascending limb accounts for reabsorption of 25 to 30 percent of filtered sodium, and the following sites in the nephron are unable to compensate for the increased sodium load. The loop diuretics may increase renal blood flow, possibly by enhancing prostaglandin synthesis. Nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs inhibit renal prostaglandin synthesis, and can reduce the diuretic action of loop diuretics. As we said before, due to normal reabsorption, there will be a certain normal voltage that causes calcium and magnesium ions to move from the tubular lumen to the blood through interstitial spaces. So, by using loop diuretics, sodium and potassium reabsorption are inhibited, leading to inhibition of calcium and magnesium reabsorption. In patients with normal serum calcium concentrations, hypocalcemia, does not result, because calcium is reabsorbed in the distal convoluted tubule. The loop diuretics are the drugs of choice and are useful in emergency for reducing acute pulmonary edema and acute or chronic peripheral edema, caused from heart failure or renal impairment. Because of their rapid onset of action, particularly when given intravenously. Loop diuretics, 
along with hydration, are also useful in treating hypercalcemia, because they stimulate tubular calcium excretion. They are also useful in the treatment of hyperkalemia. Now let's talk about their adverse effects. Loop diuretics can cause acute hypovolemia, because of the severe and rapid reduction in blood volume, with the possibility of hypotension, shock, and cardiac arrhythmias. Hypokalemia and hypoglymacalosis. Hypomagnesemia may occur with chronic use of loop diuretics combined with low dietary intake of magnesium. Hyperuricemia occurs with the use of furosemide and ethacrinic acid, as they compete with uric acid for the renal secretory systems, thus blocking its secretion and causing gouty attacks. Ototoxicity Reversible or permanent hearing loss may occur with loop diuretics, and the risk increases with co-administration of other rhodotoxic drugs such as aminoglycosides antibiotics. Ethacrinic acid is the most likely to cause deafness. And the last category we'll talk about in this lecture is, osmotic diuretics. These agents are hydrophilic chemical substances, that are filtered through the glomerulus, such as mannitol and urea. They result in a higher osmolarity of the tubular fluid, and prevents further water reabsorption, resulting in osmotic diuresis. Osmotic diuretics are used to increase water excretion rather than sodium excretion, so they are not useful for treating conditions in which sodium retention occurs. They are used for patients with increased intracranial pressure or acute renal failure due to shock, drug toxicities, and trauma. Maintaining urine flow preserves long-term kidney function. Manitol is not absorbed when given orally and should be given intravenously. Their adverse effects may include, hypotension, reflux tachycardia, and extracellular volume expansion, temporarily, because the presence of manitol in the extracellular fluid, extracts water from the cells. That's all for this lecture. In the next lecture we'll discuss thiazide diuretics and potassium sparing diuretics. If this lecture was useful for you, leave like and a comment of your opinion, subscribe if it's your first time here and keep following us.